Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. A common exercise at many diversity trainings for nonprofits, churches, or universities is the privilege walk, in which a group of participants stand together in a line, each take a step forward or backwards in response to statements such as, if you are a white male, take one step forward. If you are a person of color, take one step back. After responding to many questions, the participants find themselves arrayed along a continuum of privilege. Next are conversations about advantage, discrimination, inequity, power, and oppression. I've done this activity. I thought it was a bunch of crap. Our guest today has done a deep dive into the origins of the privilege walk. I'm not sure he doesn't agree with me. Let's discuss this and a lot more. Well, warm greetings. Greg and I are really looking forward to chatting with you, Christian. Um, you're a uh, uh, a hero of ours. We've been following your work for quite a while, and um, welcome to the welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. And, Thanks for uh, the kind. Words. And you are a uh, economics professor at John Jay College and University uh, a, a, in New York. Prolific City writer. University of New York. Yeah. Uh, prolific writer. Uh, written multiple books, uh, one on climate change that was actually 10 years ago, but still pretty pathetic in what you were saying of the political implications of climate change. Uh, most recently wrote uh, this book, Radical Hamilton, which I hope we can chat with you a little bit about that. Sure. But the but the reason the reason we're having you on is Greg and I share a lot of articles. We're always sending things back and forth. And he shared this article with me from uh, the non-site, which is, is this Adolf Reed's? Um, uh, Adolf Reed and Walter and Michael, yeah. yeah. This, this particular article is a long article. It's called The Privilege Walk. And uh, I was just, I was fascinated when I read it. Let me read the the blurb on it. How Herbert Marcuse's widow used Scientology-linked cult methodology to game identity politics and thus help steer the U.S. left down the dead-end path of a of identitarian cycle babble. Now that that's got to be one of the better um, sub-article statements <laughs> that I've read. Well. It, we we previously had on uh, Norm Finkelstein, whose book really covers a lot of the themes of your your article, and this was a fascinating fascinating article. Give me a little bit of the background of this, uh, beginning with you hitchhiking across country. I mean, well, when I was nineteen, I hitchhiked across the country to San Francisco. Where my aunt lived and still lives, and I had I had lived out in the Bay Area for a year when I was ten, and and in Northern California for like a winter with my mother when I was around five years old. So we always sort of had a connection to the Bay Area, and uh, moved out there and got a job moving furniture and went to this weird college called the New College of California. That was pretty great in a lot of ways, and um, it ultimately went under when it fell victim to a group of um, Tibetan scam artists, which is like a story in, on, uh, in and of itself. And they convinced, <laughs> the, they convinced the president of the college, who was actually the, the son of a famous movie actress from the 40s, and he kind of kept the thing afloat with his dwindling fortune. And they convinced him to give him, give them like, uh, one of them kind of passed himself off as, as like Tibetan royalty uh, or to Nepalese royalty or something like that. And then they they ended up murdering somebody, this gang of a couple of these guys. And then the whole thing blew up and there was this massive investigation. And then they like dug into what was going on at New College and they realized that they had given this guy a degree basically in exchange for some money that he promised it never gave. And that's how New College collapsed. But that was way after I was there. But yeah, so I went to the New College of California, which was um, which had some actually great professors and some really great, interesting students. And there I studied with um, in one of the kind of foundational courses with a young 
uh, professor who had actually studied personally a bit with Michel Foucault. And we did in this class, this the privilege walk. And, and the privilege walk is, for those who don't know, where participants stand on a line and then in response to a series of questions, move forward or backward, you know, if you're, you know, uh, you know, take one step forward if you're uh, white, you know, take one step forward if you're a man, you know, uh, take one step, you know, I, I forget whether it's like taking steps backwards or forwards, but it's just, you know, what happens in the end is that you get this, the group is arrayed along a spectrum of privilege, right. which if you have any kind of now, so you can sort of sum up from, you know, five minutes of conversation with those people, their accents, you know, like whatever. Um, and and so that's, you know, it was about, that's what it was, you know, and then you're, you're just sort of like, I forget, I don't think there was much discussion about it even. And then over the years, I, I increasingly would hear about this and people were like, oh, I did this amazing uh, workshop, this thing. And it was like, I was, was like, yeah, I did that, you know, I, I did that, you know. And then it finally occurred to me, it got to the point where it was like blowing up everywhere. And I realized like, wait a minute, like, where did this come from? And like so much of, of, you know, for lack of a better term, woke insanity, so much of it tracks back to the Bay Area mm -hmm. and Tides Foundation and that whole scene. And so, I mean, I was like, I'll bet that that was like, I got bet I was pretty close to the origin of this. And so there was a group of kids, college students who had been part of this program called um, New Bridges, which worked with high school students. And this program had been created by Ricky Sherover Marcuse. And Ricky Sherover Marcuse was the main person who had created this exercise, which is sometimes called the power shuffle, but is better known as the privilege walk. And so indeed, you know, I was sort of close to the beginning of it because it was only like four or five years old at that point. And it had just been used with new bridges and these like political, uh, you know, camps with, um, you know, programs, after school programs, summer programs with high school students. So then I, I dug into the history of, of the Privilege Walk. And the history of the Privilege Walk is that Ricky Sheriff of Marcuse, who dies in, I think it's like 88, um, unfortunately very young of cancer. Um, you know, she developed it and, and she was Herbert Marcuse's third wife. And she was very influenced by reevaluation counseling which is itself a breakaway from Scientology. The, it's, a, it's like less kooky and weird than Scientology. Um, and it has a, much more of a foothold on the left. So she also in the 70s helped pioneer what we now recognize as the diversity, equity, and inclusion you know, business industry. And she was pioneering workshops around racism and and gender but particularly around race and and it was out of that work that she developed this um the privilege walk um with another guy um who's named in the article whose name i'm now forgetting but um so that's the origin of the exercise and the exercise embodies a lot of what is wrong with how the american left currently thinks right it's like this methodological individualism it's this uh, essentialist and reductive identitarian thing that it's like you know um that that if you're gay or if you're black or if you're white or if you're straight then you think this way and it's not that identity doesn't have any effect on people's consciousness of course it does but it it the net effect is to just break up any habits of collective bonding and collective identification and to inculcate at every turn in activist subcultures an obsession with difference and an obsession with, you know, uh, with the, the oppression Olympics. I mean, these right wing terms, I'm sorry, yes, they're right wing pejoratives, but they are also you know, accurate descriptions of, of what has become of the left. And I mean, all this comes out of the new left and the problems of the new left. Um, well, going uh, back to the Scientology thing, I mean, I, I 
I hitchhiked from Midwest to San Francisco and I went to a Scientology orientation and they talked about Ingrams, which are these built-in biases that you need to get rid of through their deprogramming. And at the time, I'm, you know, I was a psychology major and did a lot of work with Gestalt and Gestalt therapy. And this is this, you know, this, this whole idea of we have a lot of, um, uh, built-in problems that you're unaware of that you need to get you need to go through exercises to do so this uh, to to purge yourself from these things right. and this is this just is it's amazing that you tell this story and you can draw a pretty direct line to you know Crenshaw and Tanahasi Coates and, De and yeah. Robin D'Angelo and all of those other diversity equity people who are still using this kind of foundational belief set as a way of um, trying to get people's minds right about systemic racism and all of the other problems that we have. Yeah. And the conceit in the whole thing is that somehow collective action will materialize once everybody gets their psychological act in order. Right. And I think that is false. Uh, I don't think people will ever be mentally well as a group, right? People are, I, I think it's the nature of the human condition that there's always going to be problems between people. There's always going to be, you know, problematic personalities and politics can't wait on the, the final healing, psychological healing of every participant in a political movement. And then also, you know, you look at successful political movements. That's not what you see. You do not see like, oh, the civil rights movement that was made up of all of these like just enlightened, just, you know, wonderful people who just always knew how to get along. That's not that's not the case at all. You know, I I spent time as a youth down in El Salvador doing, you know, uh, as a kind of cub journalist, independent journalist. And I and I got to spend time both during the war and then just after the war in an FMLN controlled community and organized community and, you know, supporting um community it wasn't controlled by the fml it was like you know the fml grew out of that community um and the fmln were considered the most sophisticated guerrilla movement that had ever existed in the americas you know i mean what they did was amazing and they were not just militarily sophisticated they were politically sophisticated the integration of the social movements and the armed components and the, and the autonomy of the social media, the way they all got along. I mean, it's just, I mean, this all in this tiny country where there's like hardly any place to hide. And um, they essentially fought the United States to a standstill. And they did that through their military prowess, but also their mass political mobilization that they kind of, the, the social movements like hemmed in the American empire and actually like limited the, the, the political room that the American empire had to unleash violence. And like the beginning of the eighties was just massive violence by the late eighties. It's like the U S is really kind of constrained politically to do that. So an incredible, whether you support it or hate it, an incredible political movement. Well, I can tell you from having lived in that village, but it was not made up of people who were enlightened. There was the same kind of stuff you find everywhere people with giant egos, backbiting, people who just organically, I don't know, pheromonally, whatever, just don't get along, all the usual stuff. Yet somehow there was a set of practices and ideology uh, that, that, that overcame that. So that's a long answer to, to just say that like this, th this assumption that politics can only get right when we've all done the work and healed ourselves. I don't think that's true. And I don't think that people are finally ever going to just um, heal to the point where they can be fundamentally different. You know, we can improve, we can become, we can learn manners and learn to get along better, mature as we grow. But anyway, so it's a psychologizing part of the problem of the privilege walk. I mean, the privilege walk embodies wokeness. I used to resist this term at the admonition of Walter Ben Michaels and L. Free, but I disagree with them now. I think wokeness is real. I think it is a thing and it captures more than identity politics. Identity politics is only one ingredient in wokeness. Just as important, if not more important, is the kind of psychological sensibility that 
infuses wokeness, right? And the attention to micropolitics and to language and symbols. And that comes from definitely from the postmodern academy and the kind of the literary turn, the cultural turn. So you get like the therapeutic turn in the 60s and 70s and the kind of literary turn within academia, um, identity politics coming out of the 60s, all of this stuff comes together. And then the, just the, the fire hose of foundation money that is not discussed enough and not analyzed enough and is fundamental to what the quote unquote American left is, you know, right. Right. The, the American left jumps to the tune of the big philanthropic foundations. I, I always sort of knew this, but I got a really kind of close secondhand look at how this worked when my wife, Marcy Smith Parenti, um, who we were talking about COVID stuff prior to turning on the recording, I think, uh, wrote a great piece in the gray zone that everyone should read about COVID and menstruation. She also has a couple good, great pieces about Gene Sharp in Nonsite and um, that that are very important for understanding the problems of the US left today. But anyway, she was the executive director of a climate oriented um, group. Um, and I mean, what what I saw through her experience in those years was that, you know, the foundations don't take ideas from organizations. The foundations tell organizations what they are interested in funding. And then organizations either fail to meet those expectations and they go out of business, or they learn how to turn themselves into whatever it is that the foundations want to fund. The foundations will then, um, you know, they, in they infuse these activist nonprofit groups with everyday cultures, uh, one of, you know, one of the features of which is this DEI obsession, right? And, um, you know, gender, you know, pronoun check-ins and this and that, all this kind of stuff. I mean, this, like activists pick a lot of that up by going to Wallace Global, going to Rockefeller Brothers meetings, these retreats where, oh, this is the thing they want us to do. So this is what we do, right? So the, the, the foundations not only set political agendas, like you will be concerned with um, divestment, you know, which is something around fossil fuels, something I've, I've criticized long ago and I still think is a total red herring. Um, you know, this is what you'll be concerned with. You will, you will not be, if, if you organize college students to pressure the government to transition its vehicle fleets to electricity from gasoline, we're not gonna fund you. But if you pressure the board of trustees of your college to divest from fossil fuels, then we'll fund you, right? I mean, so this is how these strategies are created. It's not a bunch of 19 year olds with their, uh, you know, sort of cadre of 27 year olds from the nonprofits coming up with these ideas on their own. It comes down very hierarchically from the foundation. Anyway. Greg, what do you think? Have you ever done a privilege walk? No, I haven't. I haven't had the uh, pleasure. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I can't disagree with any of that, and especially the uh, the role of the foundations. But rather than what's there and what's imposing its will upon the quote unquote left, what's missing on the left? I mean, there's no vision on the left, and so of course it it, it shatters into a hundred different sets of interests. I remember back when, uh, and I think a lot of it's a class question. I mean, let's face it, we have a substantial upper middle class that votes. That 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 uh, affects and and uh, um, shapes everything, and people fall into that allure. We don't have a labor movement, really. Maybe one's emerging, though. I really don't think it's there yet. It's a long way off. We don't have a working class organizations that can counter this, and without those kinds of organizations, you have essentially a middle class, upper middle class mentality. Uh, you know, my daughter. I helped her do uh, some papers on. Uh, for for masters in social work, she says, "Yeah, would you want to go see this speaker? I think you'd like this. It's on microaggressions." And I almost crap myself at microaggressions. We live in a world of macroaggressions that are uh, uh, uncountable, and you're going to go to a lecture on microaggressions, on etiquette, on on how, and this is essentially crept in because we don't have a left. I, I I would just argue that we shouldn't say this. These are features of the left. This isn't leftism. 
that you described. This is something a different animal entirely. Yeah. Uh, I remember it. I remember when I was uh, uh, pushing my Communist Party paper in the early seventies, and uh, this is long before these issues became really central. But I approached one of my colleagues in graduate school, and she says, "Well, this is all about black people. You know, all kind of oppression is out there." She said, "Overweight people are oppressed." She went through this litany in nineteen. This is nineteen seventy. Of, of oppressions. And I scratch my head. You can't see in this picture the centrality of racism in America and in our history. And, you know, and I also remember how I'm reading in Harper's or somewhere else, all of a sudden these ethnic uh, identities started popping up. A lot of this really came in response to, to the civil rights movement because everybody seemed to want to have an oppression. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, Two things I would say that one is, you know, th that that's all true, right? I mean, you know, uh, there are all for there are all sorts of oppressions, right? And th those are real and legitimate. However, the vast majority of people suffering is common. You know, the thing that afflicts most overweight people is the same thing that afflicts most people in America, which is they're not getting paid enough, their rent's too high, they can't afford health insurance, et cetera. So if you take care of those basic economic needs, the vast majority of people have, you know, in very significant improvement in their lives. And the people who are the groups that are most oppressed disproportionately benefit from universal programs. Right. So that's part of what's dropped out is that, you know, yes, I mean, you can say yes to all that stuff, but. You know, isn't it true that everyone really needs a roof over their head and a job, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, uh, the other thing is, you know, about the the rise of identity politics and this kind of like, you know, proliferation of little nationalisms. I mean, a lot of that goes back to the foundations. You've got the FBI and COINTELPRO and, and the CIA through chaos, Operation Chaos, right? Intervening against the new left, the FBI has an infiltrator in the Black Panther Party who drugs Fred Hampton the night that he's assassinated by the Chicago police, right? There was like something like 40 murders associated with the, the uh, Panthers. And, you know, people are jailed, right? There's, there's like repression. That's been well documented. What's not as well documented is the co-optation. At the same time, there's money coming down, right? Um, the Ford Foundation early on starts funding CORE. I believe it's around... 64 right and they the foundations start pumping up nationalism uh reductive essentialist identity politics which if you're a busy person and you're not obsessed with reading history and political theory it's like you know whatever it's like like um you know what's the difference between fred hampton who's like he's a you know he's part of a, a black nationalist marxist group and he talks you know, class politics, but then you got these other people who are like just black nationalists. I mean, like a lot of people are like, well, what's what's really the difference, right? So it's like very confusing for people who are busy trying to deal with life rather than, you know, obsessed with politics. And so so that that um that proliferation of nationalisms, which becomes identity politics, is organic, um, but it's also nudged along with foundation funding. You've got the, you know, the hand of repression complemented by the hand of co-optation. Talk like Fred Hampton, you're going to get whacked. You're going to get red baited. You're going to get fired. You know, talk like, uh, you know, someone from core, you'll be tolerated. You'll, you might even get funding and, you know, and that, that's how we get to this, this point. Our, our, know, la our last podcast we had on Aaron, uh, Trevor Aronson, who wrote the who had the very popular podcast, The Alphabet Boys, about the yeah. Black Lives Matter. And it just was shocking to see how much the police department, the FBI, the informants, they started to monitor these, uh, not only monitor, but in trap. It wasn't just monitor, it was monitor and, and destroy. We have a case in Tacoma. I live in Tacoma, Washington. Just yesterday, they started a trial of three policemen with a who murdered a young black man named uh, Manny Ellis. And uh, they 
through the the gist of the story is that they said he did all these kinds of things and he, and he deserved to be restrained and it just so happened that video cameras showed that completely contradicted what the police said and they are they suffocated him and his last words were i can't breathe i was reading a paper yesterday and they were talking about in response to all of this, the emergency operations for the county, which is usually dealing with the COVID virus and the pandemic, this is in 2020, um, now got involved in, in, in intelligence. They worked with the uh, monitoring all the protesters, monitoring their emails, monitoring their fa Facebook. 700 people were targeted by our police department because they had the audacity to go into the streets and say, Wait a second! Don't choke out a innocent young black man who bought, you know, who's walking home after a church meeting, you know, and uh, it, it just it's it's an amazing, it's it's an amazing thing. But I um, when you are dealing with these issues of of race and uh, you don't deal with the issues of poverty and uh, class. And the fact that this young man had some mental health issues and couldn't get any mental health services and, um, you know, was was poor and was suffering through, yeah, through the just living on the hilltop as a very, very poor young black man. You know, that's that's more important than race to me. I don't know. Yeah, what, what's yeah, your thought? Let's, let's let's take that for a moment. I mean, because I like to look at what the answers are. Ninety percent of what comes into my inbox explains very well the problems and i agree uh one of the fresh things is this notion of the foundations because people don't see that but you you don't have you look at a moment when black lives matter matters was huge small towns in kentucky had white kids coming out with signs and so on and so forth the question i think you got to ask yourself is how does that dissipate you know in our time it dissipates and in better times when you had a popular organizations that represented classes, represented uh, uh, ordinary people, working class people, that would have carried forward. Instead, it dissipated, and it dissipated around themes like defund the police, nonsense, things like that. I mean, it just got away. And so, 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 Christian, should have been demilitarized. Somebody... Pardon me. Should have been demilitarized the police. Yeah, yeah demilitarized the police, or or better yet, there's not there's not a mayor in this country that has the authority over the police department that has the guts to stand up to a police department we're going to be demanding that it's not enough to have a slogan you've got to get these politicians so again we're back in the political sphere to make it make change what is yeah. what are some solutions christian what are well solutions we... i don't know but i mean one thing i'd say about that is you know clearly police racism is is real and very serious but what has dropped out of this whole discussion, this actually relates to another non-site article I did called the, uh, the, the Surprising Geography of Police Racism, where you find the most, uh, the greatest disparity of violence against black people by police departments is where you find the highest levels of African-American unemployment. And that is the Northern tier in generally liberally liberal cities. In the South, you find some really weird stuff. Um, in South Carolina, black people are actually not disproportionately killed by the police. Same in Tennessee. There's actually in South Carolina, white people are disproportionately just a little bit disproportionately show up in police homicides. I used the the two years that of the, the Guardians project It was like 2015, 2016, and they documented all of the police killings in the U.S., right? And um and then if you look and say, well, what, what's going on in the South? What's going on in the South is that, first of all, there's a lot more poverty in the South. Everyone, right. there's a lot of poverty in the South. And the, the white, the percentage of the white population that is poor is much higher than in the North. And there's also the uh, percentage of a, a black middle class is higher. So the, the ratio of black poverty to the total population is, you know, lower in the south than in a place like you know minneapolis or something i mean you find you just find a more equitable distribution of poverty in the south even as you find much more poverty in the south and then you find that policing is kind of less racist in its appearance where you find that poverty is most racialized you find that policing 
is most racist in its violent outcomes. And that tends to be the northern tier where it's worth noting there were uh, in some states, you know, rules that that forbade free black people from moving into the states prior to the Civil War. Those were also the states that were most involved in eugenics. If you look at a map of where eugenics, like forced sterilization laws were biggest, it was the northern tier. It was not the south. And the south, and it's partly because in the south, government just was never as evolved. It was just what it wasn't as developed, right? Um, and there was also just a different kind of social control, a violent, intimate social control. It's not like the South was a, a nice place. It's just the South was like, you know, more brutal in a certain way. And there's just less government, right? There's like, there aren't, there aren't bureaucrats going around trying to help you by injecting you with some drug to prevent you from having a baby. Right. So, yeah. You know, I is, I'd like to get, to, I'd like to talk a little bit about ra Radical Hamilton, but I want to finish up this discussion. Before you came on, I was fiddling around and I, I Googled the uh, how much do uh, various diversity, equity, inclusion people make per, per speech? And uh, uh, Kendi, $25,000 per speech. Raj, Robin D'Angelo, $14,000. ta -Nehisi Coates, just recently, University of Oregon, $30,000. Kimberly Crenshaw, $50,000. Look, though... The question is, they are doing all of this training. They are uh, taking from your, you know, your privilege rock, that that kind of the themes and turning them over and re revisiting those. I'd be all for paying them all that money if you had outcomes, if you had any outcome at all that says going to these trainings or receiving these trainings pushes people's perceptions and thoughts and behaviors in the right direction. And what's interesting is it seems to be just the opposite. It seems to be just the opposite. There's a lot of research that says when people go through these trainings, the pre and post with their, their surveys and their perceptions, they tend to have more negative feelings than positive feelings. I don't know. Is that Have you looked at that phenomenon much? I looked at it when I was writing the article a couple of years ago. And at that point, there wasn't a lot of evidence either way. Um, you know, one of the, the most remarkable thing was just that there was no attention paid to outcomes mm. from this stuff. Um, but there was there was one study from I think it was like maybe Harvard Business Review or something that was found negative outcomes. But um, yeah, you know, one other thing about the the Privilege Walk article that I think is really interesting is that Ricky Sherover Marcuse's father was. A, it's an extremely interesting character. I mean, this this story kind of wrote itself because you've got like an embodiment of the old left and the new left, right? Um, and so Sherover Marcuse's father comes from Eastern Europe as a kid, I forget where, and, you know, um, has to make his way, starts like in selling, selling insurance door to door. He becomes radicalized and he is in the 20s he goes over to the Soviet Union and is one of these American industrial engineers. The Soviet Union recruited a lot of American industrial engineers, and he helped build the uh, Magneta Gorsk, I think is how you pronounce it, I'm probably mangling the name, this like, gigantic steel factory in Russia. He then comes back to the U.S. He, he seems like, it's pretty clear he was, it seems like he was a member of the Communist Party, but on the DL. Right. Um, he gets involved with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's brother-in-law, um, whose last name is also Roosevelt because FDR married his cousin. Um, uh, I'm trying, what's his name? Uh, Gra I think Gracie Hall Roosevelt, I forget his name. But anyway, and the guy dies young. But they, and so, so um, Miles Sherever Marcuse becomes the Spanish Republic as the as Franco's fascist, you know, Franco rebels, starts the fascist rebellion that leads to the Spanish Civil War. And Miles Sherver Marcuse becomes the Spanish Republican government's purchasing agent in America. And he buys lots and lots of essential materials for the war effort in Spain. So, and he's, uh, he's involved on the you know on the dl on the qt in secret with the roosevelt white house 
that was actually, you know, hemmed in by these right wing isolationists, but but actually helping him, Mar Marcuse, I mean, uh, so, sorry, Sherover, uh, Miles Sherover, get weapons to Spain. And he's finally busted in all this by right wingers in the aircraft industry. He's he's gotten to the point where he's he's already shipped some um, planes to Spain, but he's got he's putting in an order for like 50 or 150 planes. And then these like right wingers in the aircraft industry blow the lid on that. He then goes to Mexico, makes documentaries about the Mexican revolution. He then goes, he then buys the rights to some Charlie Chaplin films um, in the Czech Republic and gets a big sum of money from the Czech Republic to, to, or he buys the rights and then sells the rights in the Czech Republic, gets this big chunk of change from the, from the communist government in the Czech Republic after the war, invests in what becomes the largest steel uh, plant in Venezuela, and then eventually ends up in Israel and marries, uh, you know, leaves his family in New York, uh, ends up marrying a woman from, from Latvia and is um, and is a kind of a luminary in Israel and on, very much on the left of the kind of, you know, the Israeli scene there. And um, it's just, you know, it's a really, it's a sad and, and kind of an almost made he to order. He becomes disenfranchised with his daughter. They eventually kind of connect and, yeah, yeah it, 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 reaching out to her and she's like, you know, she's mad at him because he walked out on the family. I get it. That's, that's a bad thing to do, but. Right. Changing the subject, Greg sent me this book, I don't know, two years ago, Greg, um, yeah. An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution by Charles Beard. What is it, 1913, 1920, something like that. And um, as a, it, a the, the, the gist of it is uh, this, he was, a, I think, a conservative historian. He just looked at all 50. Yeah, all, I don't know if he's conservative. I think he was sort of like. Was he wasn't well? Anyway, he he was a legitimate historian that looked at the fifty founding fathers, and from the founding fathers uh, tried to figure out um, what were their economic interests. What would you know when they were arguing various um, positions for the Constitution? How much of that did it was it their own selfish interest? And you found that almost to a person that yes in fact they made all of their decisions based on what was good for them economically and i think that's the first chapter in your book here yeah radical I mean, that, radical hamilton well, in a way I mean, am, 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 am i missing something no, i think yeah i mean i think that beard is a little reductive in that i mean of course yes and for a hundred years beard is kind of like the that is the economic analysis of the constitution but that misses a lot so yes the 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 framers were self-interested. They were elite men, but there was something else going on there. And it was about creating a powerful and durable state for better or for worse. And so that's what the federalists that Hamilton was central to, you know, were all about. And what the, you know, the story is of radical Hamilton is that, you know, I was reading about Hamilton just for fun. And I kept seeing, references that weren't followed up to his report on the subject of manufactures which you know sounded like it was this um very elaborate argument for economic planning which indeed it is and it's like wasn't really dealt with in the literature on hamilton and so this book came out of one reading that and then uh, the idea was oh we, we'll republish that with an introduction and then the book you know the introduction turned into a book and we didn't even include the uh, the report on the subject of manufacturers, but what Hamilton was interested in and others was uh, trying to create a government that could stand up to a world dominated by empires: the British, the French, and the Spanish Empire. And Hamilton realized that, you know, against Adam Smith, he supposedly wrote a treatment of Adam Smith, which is lost to us: a review, a critique of of the wealth of nations. Um, but we know that one of his lovers, um, uh, Eliza Church, I think was her name, sent him a copy from from London, um, and he quotes Smith in a in a weird 18th century fashion where he doesn't actually name Smith, but he kind of paraphrases and, and even quotes, but sometimes kind of like misquotes Smith in the this the report on manufacturers. And what he argues, he says, look, 
if if we are to maintain our sovereignty, we need to have a functioning government and a powerful military. And the only way we can do that is if we have a wealthy economy. And the only way we can have a wealthy economy is if we industrialize. That wasn't the word they used. They said, you know, if we encourage the growth of manufacturers. And he says, you know, there's a prevailing opinion, I Smith and sort of the, the orthodoxy, that you just let economic development take its own course. And Hamilton says, that's wrong. You know, that, that will not deliver what we need. We need to use government to intervene in the economy and direct the economy in the direction that we want it to go. And the report on the subject of manufacturers is like 35,000 words long. And it's this very detailed argument and plan for what the the nascent, the new American government should do to increase manufacturers so that it wasn't just dependent on or wasn't overly dependent on agricultural exports. And um, and so that the standard argument, the standard story is that, well, Hamilton was wrong. I mean, he and, and he went too far. I mean, he even flirts with public ownership. So it's like, you know, sometimes there's going to need to be public ownership. He he wants to create like an industrial board that will oversee all of this. Something like the you know the Japanese Ministry of Industry and Technology, Minty, whatever I forget what that stands for at the moment. But um, and you know so the standard story is well the, Hamilton went too far in the report and it was rejected, which isn't true. Oh, parts of it were adopted immediately, and then more and more of it was adopted over the years after his death um, at the state level and increasingly at the federal level partly out of pragmatism that it would you know it became clear that the government couldn't just let the economy do its thing that that led to crashes and crises and weakness and that the government had to have a plan of economic transformation and so that is in fact the real story of or a piece of the real story of american industrialization and hamilton's proclivity for that path it was born out of his experience in the revolution so he's at first he's on the front lines but then he's recruited to washington's staff and and there he gets this overview of what's going on economically and he realizes that the war is as much about economic capacities as it is about strategy and tactics and all that um and then after the war there's this horrendous economic crash and the country is operating by the Articles of Con Confederation, which is just a really a, a loose security pact, which left the states almost entirely sovereign. And things are just falling apart. There's economic conflict between states. There's even armed conflict between proxies. Like there's a bunch of Connecticut speculators and settlers who move into Pennsylvania, into the Wyoming Valley, who have, this actually precedes the American Revolution, but then it, it uh, resumes after the American Revolution, who have clashes with settlers who were backed by uh, Philadelphia speculators. It was like armed clashes between factions of capital and, and fa settler factions. There's trade wars developing between New Jersey and New York. And then ultimately there's Shays Rebellion. You've got right. Massachusetts. All the, all the debt has been consolidated in the hands of like 35 men. Who live on the coast and they just start squeezing and squeezing the you know the yeoman farmers the small holding farmers of central and western massachusetts until there's a rebellion it which follows actually two years of really bad weather which are linked to volcanoes one in iceland and one in japan and they lead to like really cold summers in new england and that comes on top of the requisition of of 1786 in which they're just trying to extract impossible amounts of money out of these farmers. And so they, they arm, they organize, and they just start shutting down courts. The state calls the militias out. The militias refuse to fight or join the, the Shazites, the rebellions, the, the, the regulators. And then the elites in the coast organize a mercenary army and there's, there's actual warfare, you know, and it's like Shays rebellion is crushed. And that's what leads to the, constitutional convention in 1787 they realized if we don't have a new constitution this whole thing's going to fall apart and so it's at the constitution that they create this very strong federal government and i mean the good parts of that were that it was capable of 
doing economic development. It was capable of implementing the vision in the report on the subject of manufacturers. The downside is that it's a very, very powerful and in many ways not very accountable federal government. And so then the Constitution had to be ratified, and ratification was not at all guaranteed, and there was very considerable pushback. And the only way that the Constitution was finally ratified, the agreement was that nine of the 13 states, all 13 states agreed that if nine of us ratify whatever this document is at the end of the summer, then we all agree to go along with it. Even if we don't, even if your state doesn't ratify it, you got to go along with it. So they eventually get nine states to ratify it and, and um, it becomes a law. But um, it's only ratified in part, in large part, because there's an agreement to immediately amend the first 10 amendments of the Constitution, which is the Bill of Rights, right? The protection of freedom of speech and assembly, um, protection against, uh, you know, billeting of troops in homes, which nowadays is like, what's the big deal? But that was a big deal back in the day. You don't want military officers coming into your home. Um, and a lot of that was about, like, the protection of the home can seem a little, like, bougie and middle class, but, like, you know, before the internet, before telegraphs, you know, when the mail was even pretty limited, it's like the home was a very important place of sort of political privacy. So people didn't want the expense of having to billet troops, but they also, they just didn't want agents of the state coming into their homes and looking around at their papers. The right of habeas corpus, right? Hamilton, I mean, Hamilton is not great on civil liberties. Uh, he, his, his line was, he said, well, we were, we've got, you know, Habeas corpus is implied in the Constitution. We don't need this. And it's like, you know, it wasn't going to pass until there was an explicit guarantee of the right of habeas corpus and on and on. So that's the story of the, of the Constitution. And then Hamilton is part of Washington's, he's Washington's uh, Treasury Secretary. And then um, when uh, there's the revolution of, then there's John Adams after Washington. And Hamilton is not part of that administration. He is employed by the army he's the inspector general of the army and then jefferson comes in in the revolution quote unquote the revolution of 1800 and a lot of those federalist kind of big government measures are rolled back and it leads pretty quickly to the disaster of the war of 1812 the brits start realizing like oh these guys are like they're pulling back their navy they're like you know i mean it, and uh jefferson eliminates all internal taxes, which are usually written about as if they're very regressive because there was taxes on playing cards and alcohol and stuff like this. But there was also taxes on carriages, houses, Horses. slaves, you know, forms of property that only elites had, right? So he eliminates all these internal taxes, cuts back on the Navy. You know, that's a little, you know, I mean, I would love nothing more than to, to see a massive reduction in the American military, military industrial complex right now. But at this time, the U.S. was a very different thing. I mean, uh, it was a, a small, weak country in a world of empires. And, and it's not at all uh, given that the U.S. turns into this big, powerful state and economy, right? I mean, that, that is the result of political choices that are made all the way along the way. And anyway, it's not a moral point, love it or hate it. The point is just to understand the actual development. And so the situation was... Jefferson cuts these taxes, they start reducing the size of the Navy, and then the Brits start, you know, boarding American ships, uh, arresting sailors saying, well, you're British, you're not American, you know, you're, you're a deserter. And, and then they start landing and um, demanding provisions, and then there's riots, and then the war jumps off. Um, and then after the war, during which the White House and Congress are burnt to the ground by the British, you know, and it's luckily the British were just exhausted, and they didn't want to, like, recolonize the U.S., um, so the U.S. survives that, but it it could have been broken up easily. Right. Um, and then after that, the Jeffersonians, you know, the the Democrats, Republican Democrats, um, realize, okay, we've got a. And along the way, they get rid of the first American, the the, the central bank that Hamilton has created. We've got to have that central bank. We got, you know, we got we actually have to rebuild this this developmentalist state. So the the point of the book is that, you know. American capitalism, I mean, it's, maybe it's an argument that is at this point finally dated, but it's like the mythology of neoliberalism that American capitalism- The invisible hand kind of yeah, the, stuff. The, Just let it, let it go. It'll work it all, all out. And, and yeah, Hamilton, that, doesn't, that doesn't stand up to historical scrutiny. Right. That's not the real story of how American capitalism got to be what it is. Whether you love it or hate it, 
the real story of this system rests on planning, right? right. So it's an attempt to indigenize the idea of planning. I'll say you, you never get beyond planning. You either have underdevelopment or you have planning and development. So then the question is, what do you want to plan for? What kind of economy do you want? This idea of like, oh, get no planning, get government out of here, that's totally ridiculous. And I think it is actually finally sort of on the wane. Right, right. Greg, what do you think? Well, it's interesting. I, I don't, don't agree. I, I think that, that uh, this country's development and evolution was driven by circumstances. I mean, by the circumstances that people found themselves in and less so by ideologies were floating around and they were adopted on a practical manner. I mean, if you uh, got your ass kicked in uh, 18, why uh, did you need a bigger military? But people believed that that huge ocean was going to protect them to a great extent. And there are certain other circumstances that led to that war. Of course, uh, Britain was tied up with the Napoleonic Wars at the same time. So they, they were limited in what they could do and what they and their reach. So, I mean, basically, you know, the real culmination, the real uh, thrust of industrialization comes after the settlement between the capitalist North and the feudal South, essentially. I use those words in a very broad sense, but uh, that, that conflict led to the release of, of powerful forces in this country that led to industrialization, the railroads and so forth. So that's yeah, but but you know the railroads. There, there's not a single railroad in the U.S. that wasn't built without massive government support. The right wing argue that they'll they'll they have this one. I think it's called Burlington Northern. They've got their one example of a private railroad, but it was actually based on the failure of two previously subsidized railroads. The creation of the roads, the entire transportation system of this country that allows for the proper industrialization, really the, the kickoff of, of the second industrial revolution. Because you've got, you know, you've got the beginnings of the first industrial revolution with textile manufacturing in New England, which is in part the result of government supported industrial espionage to steal the designs of British looms and bring them to Lowell, Massachusetts. And you've got across the North, this, you know, increasingly diversified small family farms that are, you know, have a sideline in like tanning leather or making candles or making building products, right? And that's another source of industrialization. That's all facilitated by the knitting together of markets that's heavily dependent on transportation and communications, both of which early on come down to the post office. The post office is actually basically a giant public works program throughout the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Like, I mean, most roads are built by the post office. And this was a battle at the um, in Philadelphia. What would be in the postal clause? And Benjamin Franklin wanted to say they'll build roads and canals. And, those, and it was like, they just got this one word in, which was post roads. The river systems in the Midwest, you know, we think of rivers as these passive natural features. They, they're not necessarily. Uh, many of the rivers in the Midwest were tangled with with snags that on the Red River that comes feeds into the Mississippi and goes up into Arkansas and into Missouri. There was a hundred mile long log jam called the Raft, and it prevented access to all of this land up there and settlement and and exploitation and development. It was only cleared by the post office. Uh, and the post office would declare the rivers to be post roads, and then it was public contracts that cleared those. The the railroads, similarly, you know, uh, it's the South evacuates the government, and with the radical Congress uh, in the North, they pass the Morrell Act, creating the land grant colleges, and uh, I forget the name of the act, but that that provides for you know subsidizing railroads, and so. Yeah, there's an unleashing of forces, but what unleashes it is planning and subsidy by the public sector. And, you know, the world is full of entrepreneurial zeal and know-how, but in some places, virtuous cycles are set off and you have, you know, successful capitalist development. You get out from, you know, peripheral status of just producing low value added raw materials for export. And there's, you know, uh, industrialization and it's not just it's not just uh you know entrepreneurial zeal it's like you've got you have to have a developmental estate supporting it right 
So, yeah, and that's I, not a, that's not a point about social it. justice. That that those developmental states aren't necessarily nice to workers, but it's like the point is kind of more meta, which is that like there is no escape from planning, right? Like the free market is really not real. I mean, that is that is a real that's, myth. That's the value I think of uh, Charles and Mary Bird's work, uh, Beard's work, and that is it shows that the conditions for this kind of expansion, this kind of of development are are laden by capturing government and that's what they were saying essentially the government was captured by financial and 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 uh industrial and and southern interest and that capture allowed these things to happen and with that capture no, I, I i disagree with that it's not captured certainly not captured i mean under development to the extent that it's captured under development is maintained in the south it is it is the slave power yeah. It is the yeah. it is the disproportionate the power of the southern elite that leads to the failure of industrialization in the South. There's a great book by um, John um, Majewski, who he's written two books. One is called Industrializing Slave Economy. Um, I forget the the other one is about is compares a county in Pennsylvania with a county in Virginia. But anyway, his what he shows in his work is that. There were always these Whigs in the South, right? There were always these, you know, um, developmentalist Whigs in the South who wanted industry, they wanted railroads, and they could never overcome the 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 political impediments. Were that there was this agrarian slave class that refused to subsidize all of this, and also that the you know the the impact of slavery itself was such that. It meant that you had low rates of urbanization. You had, uh, you know, a workforce workforce both enslaved and poor, free white and poor, free black. But you know, ten ten percent population is free African American, or ten percent of the African of African American population under slavery is free. Um, you know, these this population is generally broke, right? Because there's this over concentration of wealth. So even if you do get your act together to create a railroad, you're just not going to have that much traffic, right? And so again and again, there are these efforts at development that fail in the South. So to the extent that government is captured by the slave power, it doesn't lead to development. It leads to underdevelopment. And it's frequently the political class that has a vision that is rooted not in capitalist accumulation, but is rooted in matters of state vis-a-vis -vis the international community. And these are also not pretty motivations, but Hamilton embodies this. His concern, you know, he's not a man of the left, but he's a well-to-do lawyer, marries into a rich family. His concern was, are we going to be conquered or not? You know, and he wants a strong bureaucratic system that can support a strong military to face the rest of the world and to hopefully then, you know, expand throughout this continent and go as far as possible, right? So, I mean, this get, this actually gets into a larger point, which is I think I think the state. I mean, this is one of the faults, uh, one of the, the blind spots still to this day in Marxist political economy is the capital state remains not properly theorized. It's, it's easy to dismiss, but the reality is that we live at a time of, of what in the '30s was called state monopoly capitalism, and it fits perfectly as an expl explanatory structure on what we have today in America. Well, we have well, certainly, that's that's problems. today. I mean, if you want to talk about like agency but capture, that's, that's I mean, theorized in the in the twenties and thirties, and it applies today. It, it's a it's a concept of the state that certainly is far more viable than most other neo Marxist or or liberal views of what this how the state functions. Yeah. What's the alternative explanation of how the state functions? What What's the alternative explanation of how the state functions? Yeah, I mean, apart from a Marxist explanation that sees the state as really... First of all, I don't know if there's a Marxist explanation of how the state functions. I don't think there okay, is. Okay, fine, but, but, but what yeah. would be an alternative to that kind of a Marxist explanation? What, 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 well, what I just laid it out to you. I just laid it out to you, but you didn't listen, apparently. First of all, first of all, listen, if you want to explain current political economy or do you want to explain capitalist economic development, because they're two different things, right? Because current political economy, you have to understand deindustrialization, right? You have to understand World War II, U.S. hegemony, overproduction, the cold, the role of the Cold War in shaping the American state so that it wants to increase development 
in its allied states, how that then leads to recovery and then the crisis of overproduction, a profit crisis that goes with that, and then the turn away from embedded liberalism and Keynesianism towards neoliberalism, the financialization of the economy, deindustrialization of the economy, and yes, increased agency capture. But that's specific to that part of history. If you're trying to understand how America industrializes, saying, uh, you know, elite capture, that, that doesn't, that, that's not what it is. I mean, there is no, there is, there are no like uh, textile barons to capture state policy, right? They develop out of state policy. There is oh. state policy that's like, we want, we want a textile industry. You know, we're going to use state power to create a textile industry. That textile industry then creates a sp specific faction of capital that will, of course, try to get its way, et cetera, et cetera. But if, you know, you, you cannot you cannot just begin from this moment and project back, oh, it's, it's you know, elite capture. What I'm suggesting is you look at Beard and Beard's claim. It's a simple claim. I think it's it's an irrefutable claim. I know a lot of new left people in the 60s, uh, they talk about reductionism, et cetera, et cetera. I have no, no idea. I guess I'm not smart enough, but what they're really driving at by saying that it's a simple claim. It's a claim that the interest of those people shaped the policies of the government to which they contributed, which they formed. Yes, in those a general policies, sense, in a general sense. It's not generally, the, yeah. and, and how in it a sense that they're producing, they're reproducing follow. the class system. It doesn't follow. That, that that government that they created did in fact always serve their interest. It didn't follow that in fact they saw the contradictions that were late in that. Those things ensued. They came later, but they created well, this government. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have to agree to disagree because I don't agree with that. I think if you you know you look at the history of capitalist development, what you see is first of all fragmentation, right? And you've got different state policies, and you've got states that encourage development. And it's it's a slow accumulation of power in the hands of the federal government that's really not complete until World War II, the New Deal and then World War II. The story of American economic development is one of both industrialization and continued underdevelopment, right? The South let can't get its act together. Let me ask you a question, because I think it goes to perspective here. We have different perspectives. If there hadn't been a Shays Rebellion, uh -huh. if there had not been a Whiskey Rebellion, if there had not been uh, a war of 1812, and if there had not been an Alexander Hamilton, don't you think that that early history of the United States would be much the same as it as it is without Alexander Hamilton? Didn't those those events shape yeah. far more than his policy? His policies were there and probably became attractive, looked attractive to people. And in, in, my answer in is people. my answer is no, and I opened the book. Okay with a comparison to Simon Bolivar. And I, yeah, what you're suggesting is that it was inevitable that the United States end up as it is. And I don't, I don't, no, I don't buy that's that. That's not what I said. Well, that's, what that's I said what it was... sounds like. World, there's been so many attempts influenced by Hamilton to create developmental states. They don't always succeed, you know? And then in retrospect, like, well, Latin America was always gonna be underdeveloped. Why? Because it's warm? No, it's because political fragmentation took hold, you know? And where you find developmental states having good runs, you find more industrialization. Brazil, Mexico, prior to being ravaged by neoliberalism. South Korea, yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's the that's probably the most successful story of the developmental state. Right. I got to change the subject because we've only got a couple minutes left, and I loved your take on the COVID situation, and in general. I read, I saw, an, uh, uh, it was either an article or a podcast that you did where you were talking about in England, uh, in Great Britain, the state, the state uh, medical um, organization is not giving out the jab, not giving out the vaccine to anybody under 50, unless they have a pre-existing condition or something like that. It's, it's in complete con, it's in complete contradiction with our policy. And then when you look at a lot of other countries, Israel, Germany, Britain, that they are, it's almost as if they're operating at a different level of research than we have with our 
uh, with, with, you know, with, with how we disseminate information. And then I guess you could add on to put the topping on the, uh, the, the, the frosting on the cake. A lot of times you look at the information that we have had, had been censored, uh, being, uh, um, you know, the, the, the problems that occur with, um, Twitter and people being deplatformed based on what is now factual information, but at the time was considered conspiracy. How, how do we get ourselves in this mess? And and I don't know. Well, I wrote a big piece uh, in March, published in March 2022 in the Gray Zone called How the Lockdown Left Lost Its Mind and or How the Left Lost Its Mind and Learned to Love Lockdowns. And it's got 128 footnotes, all of which are linked to sources. So, you know, people can consult that. But, um, I mean, what happened was that, I mean, this is a huge question. You're asking, what's the story with COVID? I mean, the story with COVID is the biggest, the biggest violation of civil rights and the most authoritarian episode in American history, I think, since, you know, possibly World War I. And um, the sad thing is that the left went along with it mm -hmm. and threw out this entire body of critique that it had developed, agency capture, for example, or this goes out the window. And why that is exactly, you know, I mean, we, we can we can trace how it happens, but why do people fall for that? I don't quite know, but, you know, the messages come down from on high, any Opposing opinion is censored. You know, people like uh, Jay Bhattacharya or, you know, have their Twitter accounts suspended, et cetera. I mean, the other article I think you're kind of referring to is my review of Naomi Klein's book, Doppelganger, which just came out in Compact. And, you know, I mean, Naomi Klein tries to whitewash the left's role in the pandemic. And the left's role was so egregious that she can't just say, we did the right thing, you know, applauding the CDC, um, pushing for, you know, school closures, et cetera. She can't say that because that's ridiculous. So she said, well, maybe we made some mistakes, but, you know, blah, 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 tries to have it both ways. And it's a very weak book. And her, you know, her whole argument is that, you know, if you question all this, then you're crazy. You're a conspiracy theorist. You're like Naomi Wolf, right? Right. And what's ignored is like, all of the very, very credible critiques and discussions that were going on. For example, the Great Barrington um, Declaration, right? Three uh, doctors, epidemiologists, public health experts, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Kildorf, and um, Sunita Gupta from Oxford, right? So it's like, you know, Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, they get together and they propose. And they're not like, this isn't real, but they're like, yeah, this is a real disease. We've got we to be serious about this. And they, they say, you know, we've got to, we, we should follow what they call focused protection. We should protect the most vulnerable, which is with this disease is different with different diseases. But with this disease is elderly people with pre-existing health problems, right? All the resources should go to protect that population and then leave the rest of the society alone as much as possible because lockdowns have health impacts, right? right. That's the argument. You, you can't close schools for a year, year and a half and not have health impacts. You can't do all this stuff and not have excess mortality caused by lockdowns, right? And so this is something that the mainstream refuses to look at. You'll see this in relationship to Sweden where they, they didn't really have much of a lockdown. They had, they had a little more than people often say, but, you know, the best you'll get is say, well, how does Sweden's COVID deaths compare to other countries' COVID deaths, which is actually not the proper measure. It should be how did the how did all cause mortality, including COVID, how does that measure up in Sweden compared to comparable states? Because it's not just how many people died of COVID, it's like how many people also died of drug overdoses, alcoholism, uh, cancer, because they didn't go get screenings heart attacks because they were having chest pains and they were afraid to go see the doctor because basically, you know, for a while, right, in the U.S., hospitals were saying, don't come to the hospital. Right. I mean, what do you think is going to happen to people if you say, don't come to the hospital unless you have COVID? Lots of people are going to die, right? So they refuse to measure this all-cause mortality. And, I mean, people are still just refuse to 
to accept the facts. I mean, and some of the facts are really rather amazing. I remember one like one moment in when my perception of things began to change was talking to a friend of mine who out in Michigan, who at that point worked for SCIU and, um, you know, big healthcare union. I said, well, how are things going? This was in like, you know, late March, early April, 2020. And he said, well, it's really weird. He says, you know, in Detroit, you know, uh, we can't get personal protective equipment for our, our members and the hospitals are overwhelmed. I said, but in Northern and Western Michigan, we literally have hospitals that are totally empty at night. I was like, what, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, there's like, there, there are hospitals, numerous hospitals that have no people in them other than staff. I was like, what? And indeed in 2020, a million point four healthcare workers lost their jobs due to lockdowns. So what happens during lockdowns is that, you know, the healthcare system goes into financial crisis. At the same time, government well-meaningly starts throwing money at at this and say, well, and if you know, and basically, long story short, says if you can call it COVID, you get 120% of the usual Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. And at first that had to be uh, uh, an in vitro test, but then it was quickly changed by the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services that it could be the diagnosis of a doctor. So if a, if a doctor can call it COVID, then it's COVID and we'll pay for it, you know. But the point is, you know, that to some extent that leads to an overcounting of COVID. So everybody with COVID becomes a COVID death, right? Some states have even had to like pull back on the number of COVID deaths because people died of other things, but then they had COVID. Um, anyway, yeah, the left, I mean, the left basically, I think at, at, at the heart of it is Trump derangement syndrome. Right. That's what it really comes down to at, is look, that- Look at the left did to Taibbi in the um, uh, when they when he went before the Democratic uh, um, hearings. That that was just that was yeah. unreal, totally unreal. I, I, I mean, was, it, I, mean, I, I know Marxists. I, I mean, I was on an email list with uh, some prominent Marxists where you know the prevailing attitude was, was when I departed this email list, where they were like, "Taibbi's a Nazi." Literally, yeah. saying, it's totally deranged, if you ask me. Totally bonkers. I, I love Taibbi. I love Taibbi. Taibbi is more right than wrong almost everything. Uh, and well, and to be treated left, that way. Yeah, you can't have a left without free speech. I mean, you can't. Also, the left won most of those struggles. This is something people don't remember. It's like it was trade unionists, socialists, anarchists who like fought those cases that that really helped nationalize First Amendment. You know, for a long time, it was like the First Amendment, that's federal law. If you're in D.C., that applies. But, you know, Spokane, Washington, forget about it. We'll crack your head and take your newspaper away from you. Right. Um, but I mean, there, you know, if you look back just in the press, you see in early March, things were still sort of up in the air. You had like Bill de Blasio, March 9th, saying, if you're under 50, COVID's like a, you know, a bad cold, you're going to be fine. We're not going to close schools, right? The key moment is in that, like, I forget the specific day, but it's, you know, like the third week of March when Trump comes out and he says, we're going to open the economy by Easter. And he basically throws down the gauntlet. And at that point, the whole thing is totally politicized. At the same time, there's this wave of both organic and real, but also sort of right-wing astroturfed protests at state houses. 35 state capitals are protested. And some of these are pretty scary protests with, you know, armed people, all this kind of stuff. So Trump saying, we're going to own the reopening. The Dems are going to own the lockdowns. And then there's this like, some of this DeVos funded foundation, other right wing foundations pushing this stuff. And then there's this like series of headlines like, oh my God, the Trumpian fascists are on the move. And at that point, you know, the, the center, the liberals and the far left, you know, they're just all reason goes out the window. And it's just like, they take the bait. They're like, we're for the lockdowns. And they just start justifying unjustifiable stuff and, and, and spiral down into to fear and insanity. And as more information comes up, like, oh, by, you know, the vaccines come out. If you question those, it's like, forget it. Never mind that in the autumn of 2020, you have Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, saying, well, we're not going to release any vaccines that aren't tested first by the state of New York. 
we don't trust Trump's CDC and FDA. Kamala Harris says it. She's like, I'm not going to take a vaccine that comes out of the Trump administration. Half a year later, they're pushing it, you know? Um, yeah, it's, and so then, and then it's like the vaccine comes in and suddenly oh, you have to have a vaccine. We now know that in the summer of 2021, the CDC and the FDA knew that the vaccine had limited efficacy, right? It was also breaking in the in the news. There was that case of the um, out in Provincetown or somewhere out like somewhere in Rhode Island or, New, or Massachusetts. Somewhere there was like a festival and a whole bunch of people got COVID and like, you know, 63% of them, I think it was, were vaccinated. And that's when the public started being like, wait a minute, what is, were we talking about breakthrough cases? Remember that terminology went away. Right. The CDC and the FDA knew prior to that, due to research that was done by Humetrics, which was contracted by the Department of Defense to monitor um, Medicare and Medicaid data, they knew that the vaccine didn't work. They suppressed that information so that the FDA could give the vaccine full approval because it, at first it only had emergency use authorization. And the legal, you know, it's it's legally pretty dubious to have mandates for an emergency use authorized medication. So they suppress the fact that, well, we know this thing only, you know, has benefits for like three months, you know, and then you're going to like get COVID and it doesn't stop infection, doesn't stop transmission, um, has some anti-inflammatory and, and positive effects, you know, particularly for vulnerable people for about three months. But like, that's it, right? They suppress that to give it full authorization. And then comes the wave of mandates. And unions are now backing away from it. A lot of unions supported that. My union supported it. I bet they, you know, I know that 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 many of them now are like, no, we didn't, we weren't pushing mandates. They they were pushing mandates. Right. More right. so than the administration at my school. And you know, thousands and thousands of people lost their jobs. You know, a lot of people just quit quietly, but there was also, I mean, New York City was minimum 1,700 municipal workers stuck on to the very end, refused to get the vaccine until they were like pushed out of their jobs, you know? You know, and they, they you, you sound like you should be on the Steve Bannon show, but you're a liberal, <laughs> you know? I mean, and and I, I I'm think- a liberal. What are you then? What well, are maybe you? I'm a classical liberal. Classical liberal. Yeah. But I mean, it's the idea that it, even if you, if when you question this, it's the left that eat, eats the people that question these these things, you know, the- then and that's that's part of the that's part of the problem so yeah. Yeah. good and i, I, I think I, there's I, a massive blow to the left that the left hasn't hasn't recovered from and it's, it's so well and it's you know and the, the sad thing is that a lot of times in your article on trump the, the a lot of times the for for years he was saying it's a one percent mortality rate and people were laughing at him it's three and a half percent three and a half percent three and a half percent it's one percent he was right you know? it's like it's less than one percent it's 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 like you know 0 0.3 percent it's like a very very bad flu john ionides is the uh the stanford the uh, specialist on that stuff but yeah right right hey listen i'm gonna let you go uh right. i think i think greg greg has his uh his sister and i think there must have been a problem greg, with her so we lost lost greg, him greg but... has greg greg has stomped off in a huff because i didn't know he did not <laughs> His specific version of Marxism, but you know, Marxists, particularly of a certain generation, are like that. You know, I think so I don't hold it against them. <laughs> I'm just busting your chops, Greg. I, 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 I think part of the problem is that I read this top to bottom, and and I didn't send. It, Greg didn't, and uh, so I, I can see your progression of what you're saying, and it seems to seems to make sense to me. So, oh, Greg. Greg, you just got dissed by Christian, so I'll, we'll. Greg, you got to do your reading, man. We'll have to have to we'll have to catch you up. I <laughs> catch you up my on it later. <laughs> I locked my sister out of the house. So I, I, let her I, in. I told you. I thought it was. I thought it was related. Cool, to Greg. Your, it's related to your sister. Hey, Christian, this has just been this has just been great. This been uh, this is the best Tuesday afternoon I've spent in a long time. So thank, thank you. you for coming. I enjoyed on, it as well. I hope Thanks you're stop, guys. I hope you keep Thanks writing. Thanks for sending and... that uh, doppelganger. I really want to read that. I started reading it. Okay. I couldn't finish it. Good. Go I couldn't make sense of uh, her appearance on uh, on uh, Democracy on Amy Goodman's show. I couldn't make any sense out of it for 20 minutes. So yeah. I'll read yours. All right. Good. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.